Welcome. Welcome to the Handspring Publishing webinar series, Pilates Applications for Health Conditions. This is a discussion in advance of publication of the book, Pilates Applications for Health Conditions, Case Reports and Perspectives, edited by Madeline Black and Elizabeth Larkin. This is Wednesday, January 27, and we are very excited to welcome as our guests today, the contributing authors of a case report to our book, Jesse Lee, who's the founder and owner of the Copenhagen Pilates Studio, the director and co-founder of the Danish Wounded Warriors Project. Jesse is speaking together with Jojo Bauman, who is the director and co-founder of the Danish Wounded Warriors Project. Prior to hearing the exceptional presentation from Jesse and Jojo, let's take a look at how things work, what you can expect during this webinar. The chat is on, so please do say hello and tell us where you're joining from. We welcome your questions and ask that you please submit your questions using the Q&A button on your screen rather than the chat. Jesse and Jojo will answer as many questions as we can. The webinar will comprise roughly 45 minutes of mixed discussion and practice, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. We're due to finish on the hour, however, the subject matter is so compelling that we may go over uh, of time a bit as if there are many questions. It may be helpful for your practice to have some soft balls, a foam arc, or a folded cushion on hand so that you can follow the movement demonstration, the movement practice that Jesse and Jojo will teach. This webinar is being recorded and we'll share a link to it in our follow-up email. The, uh, this webinar is also being streamed live on YouTube. And we bring a disclaimer to your attention that this discussion is for informational and illustrative purposes only and is not meant to impart medical or therapeutic advice. It's my pleasure to introduce a Jesse Lee and Jojo Bauman. Jesse Lee is the founder of the Copenhagen Pilates Studio in 2000. This is the first combined Pilates and gyrotonic studio in Denmark. Ten years later, she co-founded with Jojo Bauman the Danish Wounded Warriors Project, which is supported by the Royal Danish Ballet Foundation. Collaborating with the University Hospital in Copenhagen, this is a voluntary program that was formed to help rehabilitate severely injured soldiers returning from Afghanistan. Today, the project is research-based, medically endorsed, and privately funded. It also now includes civilians with multiple traumatic injuries. Jessie has a background as a professional ballet dancer. She performed with companies in the UK and throughout Europe. Her love for Pilates began in 1987 while training at the Alan Herdman Studios in London. She then continued to explore other movement systems and is certified in gyrotonic and gyrokinesis and is also a certified Coraline instructor. The certification program from Balanced Body Passing the Torch Mentorship Program with me, Elizabeth Larkham, brought Jessie Lee and Jojo to San Francisco for intensive training. Um, Jessie was awarded the Medal of the Danish Society of Military Medicine in 2010 in recognition of her efforts to improve the rehabilitation of wounded warriors. And now there's more because we have the bio of Jojo. You can appreciate that these women, uh, although very young, are extraordinarily accomplished. <laughs> Jojo, a professional ballet dancer of 22 years with uh, such companies as the English National Ballet, Berlin Ballet, and the Royal Danish Ballet, is one of the pioneers of the Pilates Method Alliance program and initiative, Heroes in Motion. 
She is the director and co-founder of the medically endorsed Danish Wounded Warriors Project, a research-based, privately funded knowledge and training center for both wounded soldiers and civilians with multiple traumatic injuries. In 2012, Jojo, uh, in 2010, Jojo was also awarded the Medal of the Danish Society of Military Medicine. And in 2012, both she and Jesse Lee were awarded the Anders Lassen School by um, the Crown Prince Frederick of Denmark in recognition of their specialized humanitarian efforts. In 2015, Jojo and Jesse were invited by the British Parliament to participate in an all-party parliamentary group on arts, health, and well-being at the House of Commons. She also contributed, together with Jesse, to the well-being of a Danish military camp for soldiers suffering from PTSD and their transition back into civilization. As you can appreciate, I could go on. However, let's hear now from Jesse Lee and Jojo Bauman their journey of 10 plus years in creating the Danish Wounded Warriors Project, which then uh, resulted in their creating a case report for our forthcoming book. Thank you, Elizabeth, and also thank you, uh, Madeline, for inviting us to uh, join this webinar series. Um, we also want to acknowledge the uh, effort that you're putting into making all this happen and gathering people from uh, across the world on this digital platform. So we are currently in Copenhagen Pilates Studio, um, and we are super excited to be here today. Mm. We thought it could be perhaps a nice way to start to share a short film with you um, that kind of invites you into the lives of our Danish wounded warriors uh, and sharing our decade of experience working with real people in real time who are faced with adversity on a daily basis. So um, Hilary, if you could bring up the film. So I guess you could say that the Danish Wounded Warriors Project was created by a need. Denmark was really hit rather hard by the war in Afghanistan, where many young soldiers returned home with multiple traumatic injuries, drastically changing their lives forever. And that's not just physically, but also psychologically. Not only had they lost limbs and suffered loss, but they'd lost their purpose, their identity, their jobs, and their whole lives as they once knew it. In 2010, we threw ourselves in the deep end and began volunteering our time to work with two young soldiers, both with double amputations. Here you can see Mark, who was training alongside professional ballet dancers from the Royal Danish Ballet Foundation, where we were granted permission to use the gym after hours for the first four years of our voluntary work. We also had the opportunity to work with Christian, who you can see here, who lost both legs on his very last patrol in Afghanistan, just a day before he was supposed to return to Denmark to be reunited with his family. With the support of the Royal Danish Ballet Foundation, we kind of made the theater a second home for the soldiers. And despite our original plan of approaching their injuries purely from a physical perspective, something rather unexpected started to evolve. We'd unconsciously created a non-medical, non-military environment, mixing probably the most agile movers in the world together with what society labeled as disabled. It was quickly more than apparent to us that these guys were far from disabled. In fact, they were probably the most able movers we'd ever met. It might take them longer to do things, but disabled, they most certainly were not. In 2014, our passion and intrigue drove us to explore the possibilities of expanding our specialized training programs to help more people and decided to see if we could get the same successful results with civilians. Here is the incredible Estrid, who aged 10 in the state of a fever dream, slept walked out of her fifth story bedroom window and miraculously survived. Her goal, to be an average preteen, to run, to skip, to dance, 
and to walk barefoot in the sand. So here we were again acknowledging and wholeheartedly respecting that it is unquestionable that if one gets blown up or if one is exposed to chronic trauma, there will be a psychological repercussion. Copenhagen University Hospital were giving us feedback that not only were they witnessing an improvement of balance and posture, core strength and gait, but they were also seeing a whole new demeanor. Patients were going from being very stone-faced to appearing enlightened and more confident and apparent self-worth as they were successfully attaining a sense of safety and mastery over their new body arrangements. Our validated research showed results of statistical significance to improved quality of life, despite doctors previously declaring them as stationary, meaning that no further improvements were to be expected. 61% have even returned to the workforce. Others are now representing their country in the Paralympics. Others who questioned whether even having a girlfriend or a family would ever be an option for them are now enjoying fatherhood blissfully. Thank you, Hilary. <laughs> yeah, so we would just like to rewind back 10 years ago um, to the early beginnings of the Danish Wounded Warrior Project. Um, we did not initially have a lot of experience in working with clients that suffer from multiple traumatic injuries. Um, so we uh, reached out and sought advice and mentoring from uh, you, Elizabeth. And also we want to mention um, physiotherapist Michael Podlensky uh, from the US Naval Hospital in San Diego. Um, and also we have worked with amazing instructors uh, who have generously uh, given their time mm. to work with the project. Yeah, and that's a particularly Hadar Schwartz from Israel and of course the wonderful Alan Herdman who uh, has really played a huge role uh, in our collaboration uh, of international experts. And you know so it's it's of this it was it was hugely important for us to gain more knowledge uh, on on these really uh, injuries of such magnitude. Um, and one thing is to understand the physical challenges uh, that the participants had, but we also knew that there would be a mental trauma component in the form of stress, anxiety, and varying degrees of PTSD. So, you know, as Pilates instructors, we stayed within our scope of practice and we began with what we knew, which was movement as our tool, the Pilates system and also other movement modalities. Um, so, however, over time, uh, we noticed that the program that we were doing also had a significant effect uh, on their mental well being. So when you asked us to uh, contribute in the Pilates Health and Applications book with our chapter on, on trauma-related stress and anxiety, um, I think it really uh, forced us to actually think about what is it that we do. Um, I think in the 10 years we've just been really, uh, you know, doing the groundwork, teaching and uh, working very much from an intuitive approach. Um, and sort of trying to get it into words is 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 real uh, interesting process. So I think what we can bring to the table today is first and foremost, our experience and our approach um, to so so the program will today also incorporate some uh, movements. And uh, we've just boiled it down to some very simple movement that will help the client come into a more parasympathetic state. As many of these clients live in fight or flight mode, uh, uh, high stress. And then we'll be doing a uh, gate related case study film, um, which will show one of our Danish wounded warriors. Um, the gate assessments have always been a really uh, important tool for us, not just for a functional evaluation, but also for detecting mental states. Mm. And I think it was that that really caught our intrigue uh, a decade ago when we sort of sat down and asked ourselves the question could a pilates based intervention possibly contribute to a better quality of life uh, could it be a tool to help them return to life 
Um, so we started to delve into some research to see if we could find anything within the field of trauma related to Pilates. And we were not that successful in finding an awful lot, but we did find a, a, a huge amount of very successful studies on mindfulness. And this was really inspiring. Having said that, some of our soldiers had actually tried uh, to participate in mindfulness interventions and actually had found it somewhat mind provoking to be asked to sit quietly and still together with their thoughts. So evidence shows it's a fantastic um, uh, approach uh, and a tool for PTSD. But we started to therefore question, yeah, it, of course, it's a fantastic tool, but maybe it's not a starting point for everyone. So we started to discuss, well, could we begin with the body and then slowly start to integrate the mind? So really meet these guys on a level that they understand and appreciate that they're comfortable in with physicality, with exercise, with discipline, and then slowly start to perhaps bring in the breath, sneak it in there with just, oh, let's just make it more uh, for the sake of better movement. Um, and and sort of get a little bit away from this, you know, five, six, seven, eight, let's go pound them and actually start to bring them a little bit more into their internal awareness, perhaps just by cueing of asking them to rotate around their central axis or start to get more into the body of imagining the lungs, you know, um, cradling the heart and just starting to slowly connect the mind and the body. And of course, Joseph Pilates was was shouting this from the hilltops as far back as the 40s, you know, about contrology being this trinity of uh, mind, body and spirit. So this kind of really gave us that confidence, right, to just keep on delving and keep on digging. And then we found that actually even leading psychologists within the field of trauma were actually, and Hilary, if you could bring up the slide so I don't misquote anybody, that would be wonderful. Um, saying that many trauma survivors require incorporation of some form of somatically oriented therapy to attain, and this is the lovely bit, a sense of safety and mastery over bodies that have become highly deregulated as a result of chronic trauma exposure. And this was the moment where we said, well, let's try. Let's try and create our own intervention protocol study and measure our outcomes along the way. So uh, we recruited both soldiers and civilians with multiple traumatic injuries, and we began to try to create our own inclusion exclusion criteria. So Hilary, if you could bring that slide up. And this is really just sort of showing a few um, examples here. So obviously everyone had to be cleared by a doctor before they began. Anyone with a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder had to have a professional person of contact if we felt we needed further support uh, and vice versa. So um, we began with this and then from here we discussed that we wanted to have both validated tests as well as what we call PROM, P-R-O-M, which stands for Patient Recorded outcome measures. And this really means that the participants themselves are the experts. We are certainly not in a position to be saying, wow, you have so much more vitality today and uh, you're sleeping so much better, right? That, you know, they are the masters of their own ship and they are the ones that are experts on themselves. So um, Hilary, you could bring up perhaps uh, the example of one of our um, validated tests here. This is the 15D. Uh, which is a validated health-related uh, quality of life instrument where the participants grade themselves within 15 different dimensions of everyday life, such as vitality, depression, discomfort, breathing, sleeping, sexual activity, and so on and so forth. And you can see here um, the pooled results of all of our participants here on what we call a radar graph, which is illustrated by the different results of the same test which has been repeated periodically over two years. So you can see that's from baseline to three months, six months, 12, 18, and 24 months. And you can see the result chart on the left uh, that the 15D score actually improved with each testing and reached statistical significance already at 12 months. And after 24 months, there was an overall average of improvement of 10.5%. Thank you, Hilary, you can take us out of the PowerPoint. 
Yeah, so the, the 15D validated life questionnaire that you just saw really turned out to be a very important tool for us to see that the changes that the participants were experiencing was more than just a functional um, and that the program seemed to have an effect on many levels. And so, you know, we began asking ourselves, well, was it the exercises? the breathing? Um, was it the non-clinical environment? Um, was it being seen and heard and, and met on a human level? Um, uh, also the social element that the participants were in an environment with others who were in the same life situation. So, you know, there's so many things to take into account. Um, I, we're just going to try and delve a little bit into this. So we'll bring the slides back up. Hillary. Um, yep, super. So, you know, through the, the 10 years, uh, we'll bring the next slide up. So through the 10 years, uh, we've seen common threads of symptoms uh, that are typical for uh, participants or clients, if you call that, um, who suffer from high stress, uh, anxiety, uh, founded in illness or trauma. trauma. Um, and of course, these are not all the symptoms that you will see. There could be others or there could be none of these, but these are typical symptoms that we do see. So uh, nervous tension is, is really the tensioning of muscles in response to a stress situation. So it's, it's almost a reflex with the onset of stress there is this kind of normal, healthy, short-term stress. So if you are having to go to an exam and it's, it, you get stressed by it, there will be you know, uh, a tensing of the muscles. And the moment that the exam is over, the muscles will uh, relax and the body regulates itself. However, in a more long-term chronic stress situation, stress-related disorders could arise such as tension headaches, migraine, uh, tensioning of the scalp uh, of the upper trapezius. Mm -hmm. uh, and what happens is the, the muscles no longer really know the difference be between relaxation and tensioning and, and kind of are in this, this constant activated state. And on a more physiological level, there could be uh, symptoms of heart palpitation, sweaty palms, trembling, for instance. Um, so leading on to neural tension, um, which is, is more a phenomena of where the peripheral nerves aren't sliding and gliding in the tissue as they should, uh, which could result in pain, stretch, pulling sensation, numbness, or even tingling. And, and you know, adverse neural tension can arise due to inflammation from an injury, uh, which we see in a lot of our participants, nerve compression or impaired blood supply to the area. So the nervous tension and the neural tension can really feed into each other and aggravate the conditions further. Another pattern is that we see uh, that the breathing is deeply affected. Um, typical is the more shallow breathing, which is often onset by a postural reflex of uh, the free startle reflex. We'll come more into that, um, affecting the diaphragm and the entire breathing and increased pain levels. If there is pain, it will increase more with the onset of stress and nervous tension. Um, and fatigue is, is sort of, uh, you know, a picture of all of that. And I think it is very overlooked uh, as a being a, a, a really a symptom that many participants really, really struggle with. And, um, you know, it can be from poor sleep patterns, pain causes bad sleep patterns and ruminating and having the stress and anxiety. So if you bring on um, the next slide, so how would we then approach a client that not only suffers from all this a physical injury, but also lives in this high stress and anxiety? Um, we've just extracted some key points and it's not necessarily rocket science uh, is really our intuitive common approach to meeting the client where they are and laying that good uh, professional client teacher relationship. So 
I think as we as Pilates instructors can be very concerned with laying a, a good program of exercises. What are we going to do? How are we going to build it up? Um, and we want to give the client their money's worth when they come through the door. So we want to get them on the mat. We want to get them on the equipment, get that session going. And this is rightly so. Um, however, I think we can also just take a step back for a moment and Really, the session begins the moment the client walks through the door. Um, this is such a unique point to note not just the posture and, and how they move or, or functional issues, but while they're not really aware of being observed, uh, you could note things of how how is their movement? Is it disconnected or is it fluent? How do they carry themselves? What is the tempo? Uh, how do they travel through space or own their space? And really, if you miss that opportunity to observe your client moving and walking and talking, you might just miss some very important information um, that makes up a, a whole picture. And also safety. Uh, is really key. So making the client feel safe. So a body uh, and a mind that is in a fight or flight will be on guard and we need to find ways to relax prior to beginning. So it could be things of the, the lighting, mm -hmm. the temperature of the room, uh, the choice of music. Some like Mozart, some like Metallica. <laughs> you got to get that right. <laughs> some like no music. And also, uh, you know, anything that you can do to make the client relax prior to beginning. Uh, also having the conversation. So of course you want to find out what is the functional issues, where is their pain, their challenges, or what are they able to do? Uh, but maybe just taking it one level deeper and asking also about their somatic symptoms. So just how do they perceive and experience their bodies? And I think you'll be surprised. Many really have a feeling of being disconnected, uh, for instance, being numb or feeling numb, uh, not feeling themselves, mm. or even having certain areas of their body that they're not aware of actually exists. Mm. Um, and, and all this is key points that you want to put into your observations. We had that actually with our case study who had actually flu symptoms as a result uh, of moving and exercising. Mm. So I think if you hadn't had that conversation with her in the beginning to hear that her tools were taking hot showers three times a day, then you wouldn't have, you would have missed out on vital information because that actually changed your program slightly, right? Yes. And you actually used heat during the sessions. And, and heat turned out to be a real key point for her mm. to actually relax. Um, and of course, it's, heat is not for everybody. Um, so, so this was just it's just worth mm. mentioning that this is this is uh, something that that you know can be very beneficial. Mm. Um, we'll just bring on the next slide. So what happens is also uh, over time, and what we'll see is a, a sort of a vicious circle. Um, with the onset of trauma, whether it be illness or, uh, or a, new, a, a sudden injury, there'll be a life-changing situation. And with that comes stress, uh, a stress response. The body will feel threatened and be in that fight or flight mode. Um, and there'll be thoughts of, will I get well? Will I be able to walk again? What will my life be like? Um, and that can lead further into more tension, the nervous tension, the tensioning of the muscles, and if there's pain, increasing the pain pattern. This can lead into the anxiety, uh, again, with more thoughts about what will happen uh, in my life. And especially if this is an ongoing situation, um, the, the, the anxiety can really offset and, you know, ultimately come into uh, fear of moving, uh, being feeling even more disconnected to the body. So you know, what are some of the tools that we use to break this cycle? Um, if you can bring on the next slide. Really uh, just so two simple suggestions. Again, coming back to the feeling of physical safety. Uh, we know from research um, that this is really key that human contact and physical safety is, is number one for a body that is in trauma and high alert. 
And so again, creating that environment where the client feels safe and then beginning to ease the nervous tension in the body. You could almost say pre-Pilates program, um, bringing the client into a parasympathetic state before you start to layer on more exercises or more rigorous programs. You want to get them into a more parasympathetic state. And so this is going to lead us into our movement section. Um, so we can come out of the slides. And uh, before we go into that, we just want to show a typical posture that we see. And of course, there are many postural types and combinations, um, but we have chosen to just show a little bit on the free startle reflex posture, which is a typical uh, posture that we see, a form of traumatic extension. So Jojo is going to be my demo. And ideally, we would like uh, the ring of the uh, rib cage to be over the ring of the pelvis so that there's an ideal breathing pattern and a, and a good alignment. What happens as uh, with an onset of trauma, the body almost comes into a holding the breath, a startle reflex pattern that uh, offsets uh, the uh, rib cage into an angle and sets the, at the diaphragm at an angle so that the diaphragm cannot dome as it should, which sends signals to the central nervous system that something is wrong. Uh, breathing is such a vital part of surviving. And, you know, this sends then further stress into the central nervous system, into the sympathetic nervous system, um, and causes this high shallow breathing, causing a tension of the upper trapezius, and also really causing a tensioning of the whole fascial line, uh, running all the way down through the spine, through the back of the leg, and into the web of the feet. We could uh, refer to the anatomy uh, trains Thomas Myers, the superficial back line, if you will. Um, and where do you start in this whole chain of tension? We could start at the web of the feet to start releasing that. It could be just uh, with using balls, uh, but working with the feet. We're going to move up further the chain and come out of this and work on the whole sacral, uh, sacral cranial area and releasing this. So I would suggest if uh, people want to join in with this movement that you just come up and first just try to walk and see how your body feels because we're going to try coming up to walking at the end again. So just take a little walk and see how you feel. Maybe noticing if there's any tension in any areas of your spine. We're going to be uh, using uh, these green Franklin balls, Eric Franklin, but it could be any soft balls, uh, not tennis balls, they would be too hard. You could also do it without the balls, uh, but it just does give a little bit more um, roll. So you're going to come down, you're going to lie supine on the mat. Oh, we're just going to actually show you, yes, so the balls will be on either side of the sacrum in line with the sit bones. So you're going to come and lie on the mat. And just take a moment as you lie supine. So you're just going to have the feet in line with the sit bones and you're going to have soft spine just sinking into the mat. And just see how does it feel and we're going to compare. Take the balls and you're going to place one on either side of the sacrum in line with the sit bones and just arrive and let the whole pelvis land. And Jojo's going to put her hands there so that we can just see the uh, pelvis. We could also just have the arms down along the sides. Just let a little breath happen. I'm not going to over -cue the breath. Often over -cueing will onset uh, symptoms of, of discomfort perhaps in some way. So we just want to let the breath happen slowly in a rhythmical way as we start the movement, taking the tailbone towards the pubic bone. So what we're going to start is a little pelvic rocking and then you're going to bring the, pel the tailbone to the mat. And so as you tilt the tailbone to the pubic bone, you could have a small exhale. And as you tilt the tailbone towards the mat, you could have an inhale. And there's a synergy between the pelvic floor 
and the lumbar muscles. So as you tilt the pelvis towards the floor, there'll be a shortening of the lumbar muscles and a lengthening of the pelvic floor. And as you go the other way, there'll be the opposite action. So here you're slowly starting to impact a little bit into the lower back and into the, to the pelvic floor. And we can bring it a step further and take the leg up and just let it hang and let the other leg release out and just bring it so it's just softly hanging there. As you start the same movement, the tailbone goes towards the pubic bone and the tailbone goes towards the floor. That's it. Let the breath happen. And here we're just, again, we're impacting a little bit more on the psoas and the yakus, which has uh, deep attachments up to the diaphragm. So again, we're working on all the synergy of the pelvic floor and the psoas, the iliacus, up into the diaphragm, and therefore beginning to impact a little bit the breathing patterns. You can change and impacting the synergy of the body coming into a more parasympathetic state. And again, just letting the breath happen and just letting the knee be soft and the leg soft. So it's a very small movement and you don't want to use a lot of muscle action. It's more bones moving. And we could, of course, do the whole series for a longer time, but we're going to save some time and just slowly come off the ball and now just feel how your spine feels, maybe softer, longer, and more relaxed. So we're going to move a little bit further up the chain, up towards the occiput and the cranium. So we're going to use a soft ball. This could be a redondo ball, over ball, slightly deflated. And it can again be done without a ball, but it just gives a little bit more of a weightless feeling. So you want it to cradle the back of the head and you want it to lie so that the head can comfortably relax and it'll have a little effect on the occipital muscles here at the base of the cranium of the skull and just starting with gentle little head nods. So you, you bring the chin down towards the sternum and then you let the chin move away from the sternum and the movements are soft and not necessarily very big. And you just want to think of it as a little pivotal movement, making sure that you relax the jaw, the eyes can be open or closed, the eyes can be heavy in the sockets and again, letting the breathing happen. So we're impacting here the sacral area and the cranial area to release more of the dura, uh, which is uh, the hole where the, the nerves, the sheath that the nerves run through to create more ease in this whole nervous tension that could be there. Now to come off the ball, you're slowly gently going to take a hand under the head, take the ball away with the other hand and gently place the ball, the head, sorry, onto the mat very gently and just feeling the length between the sacral area and the cranial area. And this is just a point where I might want to just stay for a moment to mention a bit of the heat. So where we have beneficially used the uh, Marisha Say Bloom Smart Spine uh, heat products could be to use a globe which has some heaviness and heat on the sternum to give a sensation of letting the sternum relax and soften and melt more into the back of the rib cage, as this is also one of the flaring uh, areas here, symptoms that happen. And if you will come up to sitting, we could also be using it in a diamond shape to come onto the trapezius that can have a lot of tightness. So it could be placed into strategic areas. And again, it's not for all, but can be very beneficial. Mm. Mm. Super. Well, I, I can definitely feel a nice release now uh, in that whole back line. So now we've got that um, relaxed. I'm actually going to ask Jesse now to come up. We're going to use a balanced body foam arc. You could use any barrel. You could even just use a pillow which might be enough for some people that would just be rolled up and placed underneath there. So just if you climb on up there. So now that we have restored the harmony and balance in the postural function, which is so um, interdependent with the breath, 
we can now access a nice honest lateral line from the little toe. I'm going to bring her arm up and over. You don't have to do that if you have any shoulder issues, but just that whole length from her little finger all the way through to the little toe. And just having her here now is already giving us access into this lateral aspect of the rib cage. So just by placing my hands here, it's drawing attention to this area. I don't even need to ask her to focus on her breath. That's happening by itself as her intercostals are kind of like yawning and opening here as she's finding more space uh, for more movement. So we could hang out here and I could, as uh, she exhales, I could give her a little bit of an extra length to encourage that space the whole way down the line. Now we'll add on for time purposes, uh, we'll move on to add a rotational component. So if you bring your hands behind your head, I'm now going to ask her as she um, exhales to just allow her chest just hide her heart as she rocks forward she comes back to that lateral aspect of the rib cage and then she opens up and over and now we have access to the anterior um, part of the rib cage there so we're getting now into that whole three-dimensional aspect of the rib cage i might give her a hand here around her TL junction just to let that be the initiating area where the rotation is coming from as she just rock and rolls. And what's lovely here is you can start to see that real interplay of all the myofascial continuities integrating and weaving through the three dimensional structure of her whole body. So everything sort of starts to come together there exactly. So I have you come up and sit just for a moment, just to feel now, how does that side you've just been doing this breath into feel, perhaps compared to the side that we haven't worked. And so we don't leave you completely topsy-turvy. We'll take you also to the other side, give you a pillow there, exactly. So lengthening it, that out here into this position, exactly. So she's got that lateral, honest lateral line there. And then you could take it into the rotation. And as we're getting now into the diaphragm, all the attachments of the diaphragm, you know, some of those areas of nervous tension Jesse was talking about before, you know, some of these attachments here into the thoracolumbar junction where there's that really dense, deep fascia, here we really have an opportunity to get into some of that tightness to release this area here. And this may offset some symptoms, some somatic symptoms, and that's okay. There might be nerve, there might be nauseousness, there might be dizziness, sometimes even crying. People can just start crying and that's okay. And we encourage and support them to visit that area. And then if the symptoms come on, we bring them up to sitting. So just come up to a safe, upright position, whatever that is for them, grounding them again. And I, and I might even um, use some kind of sort of an external tactic tile um, material like a, a spiky ball and just ask them to perhaps sit and, and roll their feet sure. something just to kind of <laughs> sort of <laughs> just to sort of bring them back uh, away out of the position and upright and feeling safe and sound there so you could now perhaps have a little walk around again just to see if you feel or notice any difference uh, in in the release we've released the lateral line we've released the back line and just uh see how that feels and i think that um also just referring to some more um typical pilates exercises like the uh, mermaid so this is uh, a wonderful uh, preparation for the mermaid we're starting to open up the the lateral lines and also uh the spinal rolling which is a big uh you know component in the pilates system uh if you could bring up the slide hillary we oh, have a, a funny quote. <laughs> we, yeah, we found we found a, a quote in the Return to Life from uh, from Joseph Pilates, uh, where you know he talks about ex exactly that uh, the nervousness, and um, he's like he's like um, if we it is far better to be tired from physical exertion than to be fatigued awake, and particularly beneficial in this regard are the spinal rolling and unrolling massage exercises which relax the nerves and induce sound, restful sleep. So, I, you know, I think that, again, he's on to the fact that, that you're accessing that whole neural line where, with all the nerves that run through. And 
you know, the spinal rollings can be quite strong. So just beginning with these little sacral mm. cranial uh, release can be really beneficial. Mm. Absolutely. So should we move on to our case gait related yeah. stace, uh, case study? Uh, and this will also hopefully uh, shed a little bit more light on the results of our intervention protocol study. And um, respecting the guidelines of the Handspring publishers, we are protecting our case study um, client from the book who wishes to remain anonymous. So instead of sharing film footage of her, we are instead going to show footage of one of our Danish wounded warriors who's only more than happy to give permission to share her journey with you. So Hilary, if you could bring up the second film. Not that one, we've seen that one. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, super. So here she is, a young mummy of two boys who fell down some stairs at work, which resulted in a double malleolus fracture of the left ankle. And basically anything that could have gone wrong post-surgery went wrong. And 12 surgeries later, doctors had no choice but to amputate her lower left leg and was subsequently diagnosed as a chronic pain patient and suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, we didn't meet her till six years after her initial fall, so she has been living in a high state of alert, which has almost hardwired itself into her nervous system. She's struggling to take care of her two young kids. She's lost her business, her job and her identity. And you can appreciate here that she's trying to experience some very small spinal movements and embody her breath. But even that is just too taxing at this point as her pain level is really running on overdrive. So our first goal is to have her experience movement as a sense of pleasure and ease instead of pain. And what better environment to do that in than the Pilates environment, which is such an incredible space to experience effective and efficient movement as her body was able to be suspended and float in space, offering her support where she needs it and resistance to work against the different vectors of force to really start to connect to her body. We could start to build on full body integration, giving her an opportunity to connect and activate her deep front line together with her posterior line and interweaving that into her oblique sling systems, hugging and supporting her whole beautiful three dimensional self. Now, not thanks to you know, the, the unique equipment, but also to Elizabeth Larkham's innovational creativity, she's even able to do the unthinkable, to jump, to fly and to be free. Now, endurance was definitely something we felt was worth investigating. So we used a validated six minute walk test to measure our outcomes. And as you can see here, the results reached statistical significance, showing an overall improvement of 60% from baseline to completion. Now, it really was the improved quality of life that was keystone to our research. And our main motivation was really to help people return to life and feel whole again. Now we work a lot with goal setting with our participants and for some that might be climbing a mountain whereas for others it may just be a simple everyday task such as doing the laundry like we see her doing here now without the physical or mental ability to return to work she at least wanted to feel like she could contribute to her own household so here she is three years later and looking at her here, one might even think she was looking forward to washing her husband's dirty pants, right? As she hops, skippity jumps down those stairs. Here are our most recent results of our quality of life test. And this really is based on the participants own self evaluation of their well being, which shows a collective improvement of quality of life of 41%. Now, what's even more exciting is that not only did their pain level reduce, but at the same time, their medicine levels decreased and over half of them returned to the workforce. So now we see her again today, and I think you can appreciate not just an improvement in her functional movement, but also a change in her whole demeanor with a new sense of self-worth and confidence that really contributes to the radiant changes you see here. She's gone from living on invalidity benefits to running her own business, creating and selling her own art and crafts, and continues to inspire other people along the way. Thank you, Hilary. Yeah, so I think, you know, we included the GATE assessments in the Danish Wind Warrior Project from um, the GATE, the get-go, mm -hmm. and it's just 
turned out to be worth so much more than we first um, intended. And um, you know, you can see in the film that this rec her recovery is is much more than functional. So really, you could ask the question: What has contributed to, uh, or not just the gait, but her overall radiance? And again, there's so many factors that you can take into account. Uh, so our gait, uh, our gait case had a three-year uh, training program, training once a week for 75 minutes, um, and it was a carefully designed uh, program that, in itself, is a whole webinar. <laughs> so we cannot describe that now. Um, and there are other aspects, however, that we could just mention, and it's really considering the effect of the breathing on the central nervous system, which in turn affects the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system, which has a deep effect on the vagus nerve or the ventral vagus complex uh, that is highly connected to the viscera. And that in turn is highly connected to the emotions and our ability to perceive safety and danger, um, and the body's ability to regulate itself. And also worth mentioning is that living in this high stress on a longer term basis can also on a more biochemical level cause havoc with the hormones. Mm. Uh, for instance, what we experience will see is that, that clients that have lived in long term stress have you know, really raised levels of cortisol cortisol and, and over time can come into this depletion with like adrenal fatigue, etc. Um, and this is obviously not our area of expertise, but it, it really goes to show that you have to consider all these aspects and uh, that the change in a person's presence is just uh, an intricate interplay of all the bodily systems. Mm. So I think uh, we are about running out of time. So um, we would love to just leave you with one final image. Um, so if you could bring back the PowerPoint, um, Hilary, that would be wonderful. So we can introduce you to one of, more of our Danish wounded warriors. And it's the film. Yep, there we go. So here we have um, Jacob. Jacob is our young tank commander who suffered multiple gunshot wounds as well as a traumatic brain injury in Afghanistan. And you can appreciate that there's a lot of disconnect within his whole system. And that's not just an imbalance within the sensory motor system, but of the whole mind and body connection, which extends far beyond improving functionality and strength. It's coherency, it's the whole organism. And this one, look, he's exhausted. <laughs> this one is for you, Elizabeth, because he really wanted to share this with you. Hilary, if you could take us to the next slide, because I know, Elizabeth, you worked with him um, relentlessly in Copenhagen. So here he is three years later after a lot of hard work, determination and dedication, where not only is he standing firmly on his leg, um, but he is now a front runner in Danish veteran politics and actually dedicates a huge amount of his life to helping other wounded soldiers, both nationally and internationally. Thank you, Hilary. So this is what we have for today. <laughs> and um, welcome we'll, any questions or yeah. <laughs> comments or. <laughs> yes, um, Jesse and Jojo, thank you, thank you, thank you from everybody in the chat, from Madeline, from me, from Handspring. Prior to the questions and uh, to engage in more discussion with you, let's take a look at the slide that uh, tells the participants how they can get in touch with you and follow your work. And Hillary, it's that last slide. Here it is. And then we'll come back to, so we, um, Note that you can uh, find out more about the Danish Wounded Warriors project from uh, danishwoundedwarriors.com. And you can take a screenshot here and also um, review this on YouTube to see how you can get in touch with Jesse, with Jojo, and follow them on Facebook and other social media. We'll just note that um, uh, in honor of Valentine's Day, on Wednesday, February 17th, our guest and contributing author is Joe Strutt, who's a Pilates and Garuda rehabilitation practitioner and pranic healing therapist. She's addressing Pilates applications and health conditions. 
So now back to the back to the questions that are accumulating. Madeline, have you a a question or want to lead off? Oh, not really. I'm so moved. Um, I'm in awe <laughs> of the results, and um, so thank you so much for sharing uh, all the hard work you've been doing. And it's an honor to have your chapter in our upcoming book. Um, so. I know that you're, yeah, and I know that your work, I mean, it's a, it's a whole big process and, um, you know, what will be wonderful about your case report in the book is we'll be able to see, um, your actual protocol that you did for that one person. So I'll look forward to uh, reading that when the time comes. So, um, looking at the chat or the question, um, Michael Hall is asking, uh, in introducing softer movement exercises to the traumatized soldiers, were they able to let go of their psychological warrior, that's a quote, uh, mentality, and as a result, soften and release their trauma? I think uh, that was, of course, our first, um, our first task, uh, as I said before, meeting them somewhere a little rougher, tougher, meeting them on a par that they understood, and then slowly, uh, working from there to, uh, and that was that was a, a journey in itself. We were, you know, ex ballet dancers at the time, and it, it can get a bit stereotypical. But um, we kind of took it on a bit competition, like in the beginning. If we can do it, they can do it, and then slowly starting to weave into actually having them. I think they had to feel the results themselves first uh, to understand that it was more than uh, biceps and triceps that were going to help to teach them to walk on their prosthetics. Um, so yeah, I think I, I think I think we met them with a vocabulary that they knew. So, you know, bring in the ab curl and, you know, and the biceps and the triceps so that we could kind of meet them on a level. And then once we kind of had their interest, we could then bring them down a little bit into more softer moves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you speak about your um, the other uh, specific observations you made uh, on your case with your case report client, uh, what aspects of, of gait uh, change did you note that you might connect with um, physiological states and a decrease in anxiety? Well, you have some observations on that. With yeah, I mean, I think um, I think something might. Podlinsky uh, shared with us so generously when he was here. We talked a lot about a lot about old house, new house. So um, meeting them initially with a lot of functional um, challenges, uh, a lot of pain, um, and so of course the body rearranges itself uh, quite rightly so to move away from the pain and the foreign prosthetic or whatever it is they're dealing with. And I think. What we uh, see on an observational front is this kind of um, sudden spontaneous organization of the body. Um, you know, we nobody buys a new house and moves straight in and feels at home. Uh, so we would visit the new house. We'd spend time there trying to rearrange and starting to try and be a little bit more connected to the body. And then you go back to your old house where you're comfortable. And that's a long journey. But I think uh, for this uh, case study and for many of those people, it's that, mo it's that kind of aha moment where they suddenly find themselves. They center themselves. They are present. They are in their house and they are at home. Um, so, you know, without going into all the functional side of things, it's that moment. I mean, you saw her strutting on, on the catwalk and even in her high heels at the end, she was owning that. <laughs> and it's something about just that internal awareness of here I am, spontaneously organized and I'm comfortable being there, if that answers your question. <laughs> It's more of an energetic um, and um, tempo, I would say, if we wanted something concrete, right? Or I, what I saw in the in the movie is the the bounce, mm -hmm. you know, to the step and the tempo increasing and the confidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, as mm -hmm. opposed to oh, that rib cage is rotating better exactly. to the left. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, one of the things that we realized is that that um, you know, working with gait, it's such a 
it's such a personal thing. So, you know, if you sit on a bench and you observe people walk by, you can almost tell a lot just about how they might be in their personality or what they are, you know, what their lives are. And when you start to work with, with, with Gate in that sense, uh, with our wounded warriors, there's so much in it. Mm. Um, so you also start to, you know, shift something in their personality and their energetic level, uh, because all the exercises that we do are geared for gate. That's the program. It is geared for gate because what they want to do is walk. Uh, so, you know, we're impacting something that is very deeply rooted in them. Uh, and, and of course, in an in situation with pain and, and injury like that, the gate will be different from the gait they had before the injury. Um, so, but it's what they've suddenly become used to and they're hanging on to that, you know, because it's safety for them to be in the, in the, in the more uh, incorrect gait pattern. Mm -hmm. And then when you start to shift it, there, there's actually also um, a stage where they feel uh, discombobulated because then suddenly they're in between before they arrive in the new house, the new gate. But that moment, I mean, it's quite magical. We've mm -hmm. had some really magical moments of when that really they arrive and it's as if all the elements start to click together, not just functionally, but energetically. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's just lovely when you see it like that. Yeah. It's a great question to follow up on what you're you're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, Olivia uh, asks, how do you get over the hump of frustration when progress is two steps forward and three steps back? For us personally, or for the for the for, well, <laughs> good, for them, they might have to answer good, this question. Good themselves. question. I think she's assuming the uh, the client. Yeah, but yes, I, we we also have that frustration yeah. too, right? I, I, I think that's why our program is a long program, um, because it takes time. And uh, there is that three steps forward and two back. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's also actually allowing to be in that process of actually having the patience, both as a, as an instructor, but also as, as the, the, the participant mm. or the client to be in that process of actually knowing that that is part of it mm. and and then supporting them and leading them through mm. um, that is that is our you know our finest role mm. and motivation is key for this right but of course they're going to lose motivation at some point and then that's kind of our job mm. to try and uh, you know take it in turns to, to do the dance to pull each other along and to know that we're never looking for perfection today mm maybe tomorrow, <laughs> but today we're just doing a dance. <laughs> yes, um, there's a, a, a comment in the chat from Alex Johnson that uh, explains her, her personal and professional experience um, with uh, dance and with a spine injury. And uh, then that led her to become a, Pilat a Stott Pilates instructor. And she is asking for your guidance on uh, how to start to help her learn about fascia and the nervous system. Um, so perhaps you could guide us to some of your resources and make mention of the, the reference list that you've created for the participants. Yeah, well, definitely I'd say go immediately out and buy Elizabeth and Madeline's books that are like Bibles to us. <laughs> I'm not going to sit here and try and explain better than they can in, in, in their work, but um, we've, I think we've, we've learned from the best in that sense. And uh, we definitely, uh, we're students ourselves every day and we're reading and learning and uh, gathering as much information as possible. Um, and we will uh, include a, a reference list. I think there's going to be an email that go out after this, which is, you know, giving some suggestions of uh, different literature to read and some articles that we found uh, really inspiring uh, as we've paved this path um, over the last 10 years. We'll be only too happy to share that with you. And you can always, always contact us if you want uh, specifics, you know, and or uh, an opportunity to, to spar a little bit, because it sounds like we come from the same background. <laughs> and uh, yeah, maybe we could inspire each other a little bit along the way. Mm -hmm. so, so Michelle is asking, is there any studies done in DC, Walter Reed? Um, 
I would love to get the ball rolling here. I'm interested in studying in Denmark with Jojo. <laughs> the work you ladies do is amazing and it needs to be set in motion here in the DC area. So it's, I guess it's a comment, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so. I mean, uh, you guys will probably know more about that. Of course we did, uh, we started, uh, uh, Elizabeth was the pioneer of the Heroes in Motion and we did have this international and still do uh, uh, really respect and, and so grateful for this collaboration between uh, Elizabeth uh, and with Hadar, as we mentioned earlier and Mike. So this uh, international uh, collaboration, trying to share the love, spread the word and, uh, and to, reach out to more instructors that find this work as, as uh, completely uh, appealing and wonderful as we do. Mm. So we're working on it. Mm. Right, Elizabeth? <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, absolutely. Michelle, I'm speaking additionally to your, uh, to your question, your comment. Um, the uh, the uh, Pilates instructors and movement educators working in their community-based studios can make a really significant contribution uh, to the well-being of people in their community mm -hmm. that um, that may not be part of the military medicine um, organizations mm -hmm. at this time. Um, I am uh, find huge inspiration with Jesse and Jojo um, that they have been able to integrate a, a community-based studio in conjunction with academic centers of excellence um, and government organizations. So their, their model is unique and world uh, renowned and respected in terms of the integration of the, the best of all organizations to bring um, us innovative uh, experiences to the Danish Wounded Warriors Project. Maybe, um, Jesse and Jojo, would you speak about your your collaboration with um, with the military, with the universities, with your studio? I think it it's first of all when we look back, it's ten years now. Um, you know, I think we just went in the deep end, and we really had. Um, really no clue what we got ourselves into, <laughs> to say it as Probably it is. better that we didn't. Um, and, and, you know, so I think um, it, well, it takes an enormous amount of work and one has to be prepared for that. And it's not to put anybody off, but it, it really has to be a passion, something you want to do. Mm. Um, and, but the, the rewards are enormous. Mm. So, I think we were very fortunate to find uh, a network, a team around us that had as much passion uh, for this as uh, as we did. So we uh, we I, th I don't know whether we were in the right place at the right time. We were Denmark is a wonderful place, and we were able to literally knock on the door of Copenhagen University Hospital, um, and the head of the trauma center was open to hearing us out. So I think uh, you know we. We were so fortunate to meet uh, a person who was who was open to to Pilates instructors walking into a hospital. It's not really heard of, um, and from there, slowly uh, finding that sort of um, collaboration with uh, the hospital and the fantastic physiotherapists mm -hmm. there who do the primary rehab, uh, who would then you know think it was interesting to then you know start to work a little bit together with us as the secondary rehabilitators to to spar with them and to have that connection with the hospital and the physios into the studio here um, and as far as the military goes it was also uh, we met the soldiers through the hospital and we literally in the beginning when we started our voluntary work we were driving up to the hospital and, and picking up the soldiers sticking mm. the wheelchairs in the back of our car and, and driving them in so it was really that's where we were, that's where we began, um, uh, really, and, and, and four years of voluntary uh, work before we decided to see could we. It simply grew and more came in and we realized that if we were to free our more hours, we also had to have some sort of pay. Uh, so we started seeking private funding. And so it is- Put our business hats on. Yeah, so it is <laughs> privately funded and that has been a whole different chapter mm. of, of uh, fund uh, searching. Mm. And uh, then placing it in a, you know, 
for-profit business, which is Copenhagen Pilates Studio here, and and having a non-profit organization within that, that's also had its challenges, but also its great uh, pros, mm. you know, with having regular clients alongside uh, highly, you know, um, traumatized. traumatized uh, yeah. uh, and that synergy, which was, you know, we had that synergy in the beginning with the dancers mm. when we were working in the gym, the dancers and the soldiers, and then bringing it into under this roof uh, with uh, regular people training and uh, you know the inspiration coming both ways having civilians and soldiers wounded healthy whatever you want to call it uh, all under one roof but I would definitely say it's having the right team around you <laughs> one of um, uh, another um, comment that's uh, in the chat it comes from Joe Strutt who will be um, the contributing author expert in February. And uh, Joe from the UK says, um, how did you decide your research criteria and then uh, set up your research project? Well, that was again, um, having the right team around you. We happened to have our one of our first civilians happened to be a, a doctor who had been in a traumatic accident uh, while driving in an emergency vehicle to uh, to do his job as a doctor uh, and he uh, was in a huge car crash so he was one of our first civilians and i think he heard our passion and, and our and we didn't know anything about research at that stage we just wanted to help people uh, and he slowly started to guide us uh, into well you are actually a private entity you're not the military you're not the medical you have no ethical boards breathing down your neck you can actually ask any of the questions you want to so we then you know we wanted to to know we were really interested in the quality of life and we began there and he guided us um, and from there over the first year we slowly started to choose our, our, our areas of interest which was pain, fatigue, um, endurance and so we were guided and we are so grateful for that. <laughs> also very important to note that uh, we wanted to work also in a socio-economic arena in the sense that for us it was important that it was uh, people in the age uh, who were still in the workforce so that they would be, we wanted people who had basically been declared stationary and, and, and were on an invalid pension uh, and we wanted to see if we could get them back to work. Um, and this was an important criteria for us because one, they would have a motivation to, to continue in a long-term program um, because uh, they wanted to go back to work. Um, and also there's, you know, there's a socioeconomic side to that uh, where we did actually then get support from the government because we could show that we had this socioeconomic side where we were actually bringing people who would normally be um, more, um, a burden, if you will, to society uh, back into being self-sustaining uh, again. Mm -hmm. And this is actually, I think uh, the last result showed uh, that 64%, is that correct? 61%. 61% of all the participants have come back into work. Or full-time or education, depending yes. on their age, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Young Esther has not been sent out into the workforce yet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we are, um, we're happily uh, well into hour two of the one hour <laughs> webinar. <laughs> so, um, Jesse Lee and Jojo Bauman, please would you um, give us some inspiring closing comments and then you'll be on your way to uh, celebratory cocktails in Copenhagen. <laughs> Except all the bars are shut, so we can't even do that. <laughs> <laughs> we just want to uh, say again thank you and to all the people who joined and you know you're welcome to contact us we are very happy to uh, share and uh, yeah any other questions um, so just really lovely to connect yeah. so thank, thank you. you yeah thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>